going to show you I'm going to show you two results uh, that we did in this area, and uh, and the, they're the two most recent results. And thanks for having me at the seminar. Uh, okay, so the name tatami comes from these Japanese tatami mats, which are traditional Japanese floor covering. And they're so ubiquitous in Japan that, um, that uh, a lot of residential places, their square footage is given in terms of the number of mats you need to cover the floor. So you might rent like a four and a half mat room or something like that. And uh, the mats have been around for a long time, but in the, around the 17th century, um, they came up with this rule that says that no four mats uh, may meet in what they call an auspicious arrangement. So, um, uh, so here, this is a tatami room in, in, on the slide there, and I've just sort of highlighted the tatami mats. And you can see they look sort of like dominoes, they're just one by two mats. And if you look at, at the, the black parts uh, in between them, these are kind of the grid lines in the, in the grid that these are covering. And the places where they could, where you could have four of them meeting at one point are at these interior grid intersections. So you can see um, that there are only three, uh, at most three meeting at each of these points. And you would easily identify uh, a violation of the, of the tatami restriction if you have a plus shape uh, there, for example. So it's another way to think about it, at least for interior, interior grid intersections. <coughs> Um, we picked this problem up from an exercise in Don Knuth's uh, The Art of Computer Programming. And, um, and he, um, he got the problem from uh, another mathematician, uh, Mitsuyoshi Yoshida, who uh, worked on this about 370 years, 370 years ago. So, uh, Yoshida published a 6x5 pattern in, in his publication, and this is a reprint of that that Don Knuth is, has put in here. Um, and conveniently, he places that right beside uh, a domino covering, which does not satisfy the tatami restriction. You can see lots of places where, where that's violated there. Um, yeah, so... So there's a certain structure that, that comes out of this. And if you, if you, for example, if you put down these, these two tiles here, then, um, then paying attention to these grid intersections, there are two grid squares here which have to be covered by the same tile. Otherwise, we're going to end up covering, uh, we're going to end up uh, having four of them that meet here or here. So these two, the placement of those two tiles is forced. And uh, likewise, placement of these two and those two tiles uh, are forced just because of these grid intersections here and so on and so on. So, uh, so the, result is, the result is that that we have this very local, simple and local re restriction which, uh, which has imposed a structure on the whole thing and in fact the whole covering was determined by just those, those two uh, those two tiles right there. And Don Cluth's question about this was to find all domino coverings of a chessboard. Um, he calls these tatami tilings. Uh, I differ in that for various reasons. So there are exactly two. Uh, here are a couple of chessboards, chessboards which have been covered by uh, tatami tiles. And, um, and this was a generalization of this was found by uh, my advisor, Frank Rusky, and another one of his students, Jenny Woodcock, uh, shortly before I started working on, on Tatami. And we're going to use these in a proof in a few moments, uh, these particular uh, coverings. So we'll remember that there are two. Um, So I was going to say something specific about this when I made this slide. I think I more or less, I more or less still remember what it was. <laughs> um, but this is something I was thinking about today, actually. Anyway, so the problem of what is a domino, a domino tatami covering 
is uh, we have a, a rectilinear region, for example, this one, and we want to cover it exactly with no overlapping dominoes. Okay, um, and so just to to again look at how the local restriction uh, imposes the, the and how how the structure affects this. Let's say we put down these guys, and in the same way as before, um, I'm forced to put uh, a vertical domino here and a vertical domino there, and likewise for all of the other ones. So, so if I just kind of uh, make, obviously I'm, I'm making you know, lucky choices at, at, at the beginning because this is going to work. Um, the, the placement of all these tiles uh, is forced at each step by the to tell me restriction. And there's the last one, it goes in there. It's forced, of course, also by the space that's left to put it in. And, um, and so in, in 2009, when we started working on this, uh, Frank asked our, our research group, this, I guess the obvious decision uh, problem is that given a region R uh, with n grid squares, it doesn't need to be simple, it could have holes in it. Uh, can R be tatami covered with dominoes? And, right, so, then of course the question is, is this NP-hard? And I'm gonna say NP-hard here because uh, I guess all of these problems are really obviously in NP, and so we're really just wondering whether they're also, uh, any problem that I talk about in this talk, whether it's also hard. So going back to this, um, this suggests that you know maybe um, maybe there's a relationship between uh, between the placements of, of different ones of these, and maybe one of these can affect uh, the placement of one of those over there, and, and we might be able to find um, uh, to find that, that it's hard because of these relationships. So, for example, if I just tried to move this one up a tiny bit, so that's where it was before, and that's where it is now. Um, I can again put all the things down that are forced by the tatami restriction, and I find uh, that I'm stuck here. I can't place tiles there because there's one, two, three uh, already at this interior grid intersection. I'm hooked. I can't uh, finish that. So, on the other hand, if you remove the tatami restriction, uh, this problem is polynomial. Um, the way that we can, uh, the way that you can see that, uh, you guys all know about this this thing where you take the chessboard, you remove the corner, the, the corner, uh, uh, remove the the two corners of a chessboard, and you try to cover it with dominoes, and then you know that you can't because of the way that it's colored. Uh, so, so I guess this is that's an instance of this problem. Um, Anyway, uh, just not sure how much time to spend on this, but, uh, but we do need to know about this graph. So what we do is we take each of the grid squares and turn that into um, a vertex, and we connect vertices that are on uh, adjacent grid squares, and then um, a domino covering is a perfect matching on this graph. And so then this question, uh, Turns out that you can do this in on in on squared because this is a bipartite graph. Uh, looking for per perfect matching is the same as looking for maximum flow, uh, and it's planar, so I don't have to uh, consider the fact that there could be a bunch more edges than there are vertices. So this is where that comes from. The tatami restriction is that problem with the additional constraint that every four cycle contains a matched edge. So if you want to look at this as a graph theory problem, uh, there it is. And here, here I've shown uh, the, the matched edges just in place of the tiles that we had earlier. In the, um, so you guys all with me? Nods if you're yeah, good. Um, so we did discover that this is NP-hard. And um, Right, so, so I'm going to show you the reduction now. The way that we came to this reduction 
uh, as I said, Frank asked this question in 2009, and, um, and in early 2010, we went to a computational geometry workshop in Barbados, which I highly recommend if you, if you can get to this, this conference. Um, and, uh, and somewhere between talking about other people's problems and drinking Banks beer and, uh, and Mount Gay rum, we learned that if you, have, if you have some problem where you can kind of lay out your instances in a planar way, where you have things over here that could affect things over here and they're, they're all kind of connected up, then the problem that, uh, that you want to reduce from is planar three set. And, uh, and planar three set is essentially, uh, it's, it's three set so that your, your three set problem can be expressed as a planar graph uh, in the following way. Your vertices are the clauses and the variables. And so you just draw an edge from a clause to a variable whenever that variable or its negation appears in the clause. And if you can lay that graph out in the plane, then your three set problem is planar. This was shown to be NP-complete. I said I would say NP-complete. This is not a new problem. Um, this is shown to be NP-complete uh, by Lichtenstein in 1982. It's been around for a long time. And, uh, and another good thing about a problem that's been used for so many reductions is that you can get lots of ideas for how to use it by looking at other people's uh, work doing this. Um, so essentially, uh, we want to be able to express any instance of planar 3 set as, um, as a region which is coverable, uh, which is domino tatami coverable, if and only if uh, the planar 3 set instance is satisfied. Okay? And the key, um, so, so this, this is the, this is the, the DTC int instance that corresponds to this plan three set instance. And here is, uh, here's the clause with three variables. That's this guy here. Here's the clause with two variables. That's this one here. And my, uh, and my, my uh, sorry, literals, of course. And my variables uh, are in between there. And so I want to be able to, um, to set the truth value of the variable by deciding how the variables are going to be covered. And then that's going to, that's going to propagate some decisions uh, through these little circuits. I've abstracted out some not gates and gates. And then eventually we're going to get to a little place here, which is going to be coverable if and only if that clause is satisfied. Um, right, so this is where those chessboards come in. Uh, you'll remember that I said there are exactly two ways to cover the chessboard. And it turn with, uh, yeah, to cover the chessboard. And it turns out that that is still true even if I open up parts of the chessboard. Uh, what matters is that, is, that the, is that the corners of the chessboard are still part of the boundary of, of the region. Okay, so, um, so essentially there are exactly two ways of covering each one of these, of these chessboards that I've laid out in a grid and connected up by these tunnels between them. Um, and after approaching this problem a few other ways, this is essentially what we were betting on. We were betting on that, that we would be able to find gates, uh, an AND gate and a NOT gate. And if you can find those things, then you've solved this problem. Um, so ta-da, there they are. Okay, we're done. We can talk about the next problem now. Uh, <laughs> Not so fast, right? I mean, uh, we have to talk about how we can actually uh, find these. So here's an AND gate, and here's a NOT gate. And, right, so to verify that that NOT gate actually works, we just need to show that it's coverable whenever our chessboards are tiled the way we want them, that is, when our chessboards are tiled differently, and that it's not coverable if the chessboards are tiled the same, okay? Um, and so when the chessboard is covered a certain way, it gives a signal here, um, and I'm gonna call this false, and then this one is covered differently, so it gives this signal true right there. 
and that just affects affects the next tiles, which are which I'm forced to place inside the knot gate. Um, and so, right. So we need to be able to complete it with good signals and not complete and and to not be able to tile it with bad signals. Uh, so here's the knot gate again, repeated four times without the chessboards. And for the good signals, I have these coverings, so we're fine. And then for the bad signals, I can I can just easily show by by uh, you know by finding contradictions that they are not coverable uh, with those. And so here, for example, I've numbered I've numbered the tile the tiles in the order that I'm forced to place them. It's an order that's not unique. So the, the tunnel that you provide, is that the smallest tunnel that works? Um, as in, is, is there a narrow, uh, like a... Okay. So for example, I, it's going to be four cells, a stick with four cells high. Yeah. Can you squeeze the ends closer together and cut down the number of cells? Uh, I'm inclined to say no, be, because... Um, because we ran our search space, you know, starting with with as as uh, trying to place place those chessboards as close together as possible, um, and so I'm inclined to say to to say, you know, no, we didn't find one that was la that that was with three. No, we didn't find, and so on until we got to one big I mean, enough that we could do that. Is eight by eight the smallest that you could use for the true and false states? Uh, yes, because. Um, so, so it, as it happens, there's there are also exactly uh, two covering uh, two coverings for the six by six and the four by four and the and the two by two. The problem is that we need to be able to make a tunnel here and still have these guys be uh, on the boundary of the um, uh, of the region, and and that's what yeah. Did you use a machine to find these tunnels? Yes, we're going to talk about that uh, right away, um, just after this. So. Uh, so to search for this, we we want to look for candidate regions inside this pink region, and the pink region is just chosen somewhat arbitrarily, but you, or, well heuristically, we want it to be large enough for the gate to do its thing, and not so large that we have a, a, an enormous search space. And and so then we look at candidate regions uh, in here for the not to be a not gate, and then we verify those things that I said we have to verify. So this, um, I looked at this by hand for a short time, uh, and then looked for a polynomial algorithm for a while, and then, and then I decided to come back and attack it with, with a machine, as you say. And we use SAT solvers for this. Um, we haven't used one before, they're kind of fun. A SAT solver is software that finds a satisfying assignment to a Boolean formula, or it outputs unsatisfiable. And we use many SAT. Um, because it was the easiest one to use. And we wanted to get this, this thing going as, as quickly as possible. And the first thing that we needed to do was, uh, was express our problem, DTC, as, um, as a SAT instance. And so the, SAT, the corresponding SAT instance has, it, has the edges of the underlying graph that I mentioned a few minutes ago uh, as variables. And then a satisfying assignment sets the matched edges to true and then unmatched edges to false. So then uh, we need to enforce three conditions. The first one is the matching condition, where true, in, where true edges are not incident. Uh, the second one says that an edge at each vertex is true. So that just means we have to cover all of the vertices, get a perfect matching. And the third one is the tatami restriction. Um, it says uh, an edge of each four cycle uh, is true. And the input to the problem is the same input that I was just talking about. We have the pink region, um, and then we have the things that need to be satisfied. These are the good signals, and we have the bad signals. Uh, and we did everything in Python to just give it an initial try, and that worked. So that's what we used. There are essentially four steps. To the gadget to the gadget search, first we request a candidate region R from uh, from Minisat that satisfies all of the good signals. So, so this is kind of an extended uh, an extended 
SAP, SAP problem that considers um, uh, that that considers these signals at the interface. So part of the covering is already is already completed. And um, right, and then we have to test to make sure that none of the bad signals work. And if every if every one of these tests returns unsatisfiable, then R is the answer. And otherwise, we need to forbid R and kind of add it to the to the SAT problem that we're doing up here. And we keep doing this, and hopefully, we come out with something uh, with something that works. So this worked pretty well as it is for the for the NOT gate, uh, but the AND gate turned out to be a little bit large. Um, and this is kind of a small version of the of the pink region for the AND gate. So these C's indicate where we have inputs. This is where we have the output. And we just use some heuristics to, to try to limit the size of the search space by requiring um, requiring that the grid squares under these hash uh, tags or, or the, these hash symbols here, um, requiring that those be in any candidate region. And the idea is that we want candidate regions which are connected, uh, but we don't want to put so much, we don't want to restrict this so much that we end up, um, well, that we end up with a search space without a good, without, without a useful region with, that doesn't contain the gate. And I can't remember if this is, I think this is kind of a small toy version that I made for the top, just because it doesn't, doesn't look as large as the other one, but it's, um, the restriction looks a little bit like this. So the result is that we got uh, we got our AND gate. And so, so, the, so, you put, so going back to your restriction, yeah. why did you choose the particular restriction that you chose? Right. Well, the the idea was to um, the the main problem with our search space uh, with our search is that we end up with a lot of trivially useless re candidate regions where it's just uh, it's taking some stuff that's attached to here and it's disconnected from stuff over here. And so then there's no relationship between the things over here and the things down here. And we wanted, um, we just wanted a, a heuristic that would, that would, um, like, like for example, if, if I force it to include this little one by one square, it automatically has to include at least one of its adjacent squares, but it gets to pick uh, so that it can actually fit a domino on there. And the idea, yeah. So, so the idea was to um, was to try to connect these two uh, regions, but give it enough choices that it, that it can make inside there, so that it doesn't um, uh, so that it doesn't el eliminate the answer uh, from from our search space. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, good reaction. Really. Yeah, but that's but that's what it was. Yeah. Uh, you know, we. We tried a few things like this, and and we found one. Um, so, <laughs> so, okay, so how many restrictions did we have to try before we uh, opted? I think I might have tried this fifteen times okay. with the with the AND gate, something like that. Okay. How long did the actual SAT solver take to run? Um, I ran it on. Um, so it took about an hour, and uh, I ran it on a pretty fast computer with like 128 gigabytes of memory. Not that this used, well, yeah, this does use some memory because these candidate regions, um, every time every time I eliminate a candidate region, I add it to the original uh, SAT problem. And yeah, so then I'm, <coughs> I'm dealing with, with a larger and larger SAT problem. So, 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 so the memory might have helped. Passing to the SAT solver in the the number of variables is, is given in terms of uh, the number of the number of good signals that I want to satisfy at the same time. So if I have uh, so so if I'm trying to I'll just quickly get to here, so I I need to give it one set of variables for every uh, for every edge in the underlying graph here, and another set for for these ones. And um, but I have to do that uh, for the whole pink region, and then I have another set of variables uh, that that says whether uh, your your your, um, 
you're making me remember stuff, those <laughs> details that, that I haven't talked about for a long time. And then I had another set of variables for each of the vertices to say whether that vertex is in is in the region. And that, and that's that list of vertices is, is going to be the region at the end. So so yeah, twice twice the number of edges plus the number of vertices plus I don't know maybe some auxiliary stuff that I can't remember. Um, but then the it's the number of constraints that starts to grow quite a bit, where um, where when I end up with a region that I don't like, uh, now I put in the constraint that one of those uh, vertices is going to be false, uh, so I can't pick exactly that region again. Um, that, so that's so that's going to be like one clause that says you know either not this or not that or not that. Or not Okay, so I'll just remind you, these AND gates uh, they needed to go in here, so they they propagate the they propagate the um, uh, the coverings for these chessboards uh, to this chessboard in the appropriate way, obviously, using an AND gate, and that's that's where they fit right there. And so this one here uh, is is well, it's rotated. Uh, from that one is that rotated or mirrored? It's rotated. Rotated, yes. Um, and then you can verify these by hand. So here's uh, two true inputs and a true output, and so on and so forth. This is just the truth table for an AND gate. And then, of course, I want to make sure that if one of the inputs is false and the output is true, then I can't cover it. So I'm here, both true, and then this output is false. And again, the same way that we did the NOT gate, we just put in the tiles which are forced, and we end up with some contradiction where we can't complete the covering. Um, okay, and then the last thing in... What are we doing here? Yeah, good. Um, yeah so, so this was the, the, the clause that we're dealing with, and then the, the variables are propagated into it from here, so the, so these kind of uh, is just carry some some value, and then finally uh, the value of this is forced by the input values, and uh, and when I say value, of course I mean one of the two coverings that's possible for that chessboard, and so if you have this covering, then you're okay in that little end piece, and if you have this covering, then you're forced to place this tile to preserve the tatami restriction there. You can't cover these two with one domino, so. Um, so that that completes the reduction, and yes, so that does complete the reduction. Any questions about that? You don't need. There's no test at the end, so don't worry. In fact, now we're going to talk about something uh, that's nothing to do with uh, with complexity, uh, except for this slide. In the reduction, we used uh, we depend it depended on the fact that there are holes in the regions, and it would be nice to have one that. That, uh, that works for a simply connected region. And the same approach doesn't work. Um, there are possibly obvious regions, uh, re regions, reasons, and we are interested in the answer for this. Okay, here's the same picture again, uh, because it shows, um, it shows some of that structure. So here are those, those little uh, things that uh, you could call sources, and they they seem to propagate some kind of X shape towards the boundary of, of the grid. So you have one here, and one there, and one there, and there, and there, and there. And so intuitively, it seems like maybe you could characterize coverings by, by some small configurations of tiles. And I reordered my slides here a few minutes ago, so I hope... Oh, good, yeah. So... Um, so we did find an answer for this, and and part of and to to do that we looked at this configuration. So this is wherever a horizontal domino meets a vertical domino, and of course we're forced to place a domino here if that's an inter, uh, an internal uh, an interior intersection. So this placement is forced, and this one, and that one, and so on, and we have to keep doing that until we get to the boundary of the grid. <coughs> And we call that a ray. That doesn't matter. Uh, but the question is, how do rays start? And so we did a little bit of case analysis here to try to find out uh, 
how they start and to characterize coverings. And it turns out that in rectangles, um, coverings are completely determined by, this covering, for example, is determined by these magenta uh, configurations. This one, that one, and that one, and down there too. Sorry. Um, and it turns out that those are all of them. All of the, all of the green and blue uh, tiles, their placement is forced by, by these ones here. And you can give them names. So um, you, you, you jump right. Yes, that is a good that. thing. So as of as of this point, we're going to introduce one by one tiles called monominoes, and um, and so we're interested in a characterization of domino uh, domino monomino coverings of rectangular grids. So the simply connected case is. It's just the donut. Yeah. So, so up until this point, I've been uh, we've been talking about uh, domino only coverings. Is the region domino uh, domino coverable with the tatami restriction? It turns out that if we introduce monominoes to that problem, uh, then that's almost trivially polynomial, uh, where you can just kind of take a brick laying pattern, and then any place where the where the brick sort of goes over a boundary. You just delete half the brick, and you end up with with a one by one, and that satisfies the tatami restriction. So, uh, yes, so one by ones, and we do see this this bidimer uh, configuration, that source that that we saw with the domino uh, coverings, and then all of the other ones have one by ones in, in, and it turns out that that this is all that can happen. Um, your your coverings will will be decided by the placement of these, and um, and then you just need to figure out how to place these so they don't conflict with each other. For example, I can't have a ray from this one intersecting the ray from that one. And right when we when we discovered this, so, so we discovered this structure in fall of two thousand nine. And uh, we said, "Hooray! Now we can now we can count these and generate them and do a bunch of things because they're sort of now they're much more friendly looking as combinatorial objects." And just an example of one of the things we can count: uh, the number of coverings of the n by n square with n monominoes. This happens to be the maximum number of monominoes is uh, n times two to the n minus one. And this is this is probably the first number that that jumped out to us because this is combinatorially this is a very round number. It's the number of edges in the hypercube. Things like that. Um, it's nice. So you said there about something about nanometer maximum. What was it? Yeah. Uh, so the number of uh, in in the n by n square, you can only have n monominoes, and satisfy the tatami restriction. You can't have any more than that. And that's um, yeah. I'm not I'm not prepared to talk about that just now. <laughs> Um, so, just to uh, quickly define generating functions. Uh, so, if you have a sequence of sets, and uh, and in each set there are uh, a sub k things, the generating function uh, for the sequence of sets uh, is this, where the kth coefficient of this guy is the number of things in the kth set uh, in the sequence, and if at some point, uh, for some k larger than big K, everything has size zero, then your generating function is a polynomial. And it turns out that the one I'm going to talk about is a polynomial. As I said, we got this problem from Don Knuth and um, uh, Frank and uh, Frank Rusky and Don Knuth communicated about this a little bit. And so, in one of Knuth's emails to to uh, to Rusky. He says, I looked also at generating functions for the case n equals n, so that's the square case, with respect to horizontal versus vertical dominoes. Uh, for example, when n equals 11, the generating function for tatami tilings with exactly 11 mon monominoes and 55 dominoes turns out to be this polynomial, which is a bunch of factors times some p of z, when subdivided by the number of, say, horizontal dominoes. Uh, so, he, so he's looking at the number of n by n coverings with n monominoes 
and some uh, and then the the thing that we're generating is the number of those with exactly k uh, horizontal dominoes. And I'll, I'll express that again in a second. And then he says that P of Z is a fairly random looking irreducible polynomial of degree 36. And lastly, one naturally wonders if there's a good reason for so many cyclotomic polynomials in this factorization. And he's referring to the fact that all of these factors here are cyclotomic polynomials. Um, right, so this was counting n by n coverings with n monominoes and a particular number h of horizontal dominoes. And we can use the structure to define an operation on tatami coverings which preserves the tatami restriction and it changes the orientation of some dominoes. This is what we use to count, uh, to count the things that, that Don Knuth was referring to. So if you look at this guy here, um, we can call this a vertical bond uh, or a vertical brick laying uh, covering. And if you take a whole kind of diagonal configuration of these, you remove it and then you flip it end to end, mirroring it as well, um, and you put it back in, you don't restrict the tatami restriction, uh, sorry, you don't violate the tatami restriction, and you flip all of those tiles from vertical to horizontal. So. And it turns out that every one of the coverings that we're interested in is obtainable by a, a sequence of these diagonal flips. Of course, the bad part is that uh, some of those diagonal flips conflict, and the solution we found was to find a partition so that, uh, so that the flips that are allowed within each part, we can do those independently. And then each part is easy to count, and we just have to add up the size of all the parts. And how much time do we have left? Yeah, good. Okay, so here's just a few example, uh, two examples of how uh, two diagonals can conflict. So here's a blue diagonal uh, and another blue diagonal, but they share this monomino. So if I were to flip this that way, then the monomino would end up mapped down there, and this diagonal would be incomplete. I can't do that. And then uh, I can't flip it then. And so then on this one, we have two diagonals which intersect here, and so I can't flip them both at the same time. So that's how um, the parts of our partition look essentially like this, where I decide that, uh, that one of these diagonals is going to be the longest possible one, and then that all of the other diagonals that I'll allow to be flipped uh, in this partition, or, sorry, this part of the partition, uh, have to be strictly shorter than this one. So, for example, um, uh, if I look here, there's a diagonal just, just beside the green one, which I'm not going to allow that to be flipped because it contains more dominoes um, than, than this green one here. So, uh, so the ones that are allowable are highlighted in gray and white, gray, white, gray, white, gray. And, and these can all be done, can all be flipped independently of each other. So now we can change vertical dominoes to horizontal dominoes in a predictable way. And we can count those by using, uh, by considering k sum subsets, uh, and in this case of the multiset, 1 to 9 and 1 to 5. Um, and the reason for that is because if you look at the diagonals in each corner, so here's, uh, here's one with length 1, 2, 3, 4, Five, so that's the one to five set, and then in the other corners is uh, uh, is the one to nine set. So each time uh, flipping one of these diagonals is equivalent to choosing one of these numbers. So if I want to find a covering here with um, with k additional uh, horizontal horizontal dominoes, um, I can do that by by choosing a subset of this set whose elements add to k. The nice thing is that there's a nice generating polynomial for these guys. And that's this one up here. So it's just the, the product of um, 1 plus z to the k from uh, k equals 1 to n. And after uh, a fair bit of uh, fair bit of algebra, we, we found that 
Anyway, we found a, a generating polynomial with a bunch of terms, and in each term we were able to divide up this guy. And then we also ended up with a nice irreducible polynomial here. And so, so this is the generating polynomial for, for odd n for the number of n by n coverings with n monominoes and h horizontal dominoes. And then the cyclotomic polynomial factors come from these guys, s sub n. Uh, so that more or less confirms uh, Knuth's observations about this. But there was uh, one other question that he asked about, about uh, P of Z, or at least he made some comments about it. He said that P of Z is a fairly random-looking irreducible polynomial, and uh, I mean, he probably knew that it you know, is probably very unrandom, uh, but it does at first glance when you look at one of them, it's kind of random. But we found that if, if you plot its uh, complex zeros, um, and this is this is plotting a bunch of p of z's uh, complex zeros, and this is the this is the unit circle in the complex plane, you find that that you get a fairly uh, a fairly regular looking pattern here. And in fact, here's a zoomed in part where we see um, for increasing n, uh, we see these kind of uh, apparently converging series of, of zeros. So that was kind of cool. We also found we could tease out a few other things about P of Z. Uh, we have the degree sequence, for example, in, in terms of the largest odd divisor of the numbers 1, 2, and minus 2. And we also know what the sum of the coefficients of P of Z is. Um, but unfortunately, we were unable to answer uh, the, the main question that was in Clue's email, is that we wondered if it's irreducible. And then we also wondered if it can be computing, uh, sorry, if it can be computed without dividing, uh, dividing uh, these factors from this guy here. Um, I'm going to finish early. Well, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, so out of the techniques that we have for the enumeration, uh, for solving our, our enumeration problems, uh, we found that most of those can be used to also generate, uh, generate the coverings. And so here's an example of, uh, these are all of the, the possible tatami coverings of the 3 by 4 grid. And usually what you want when you, when you look at combinatorial generation is you want to generate things efficiently so that you're only doing a constant number of steps per thing that you generate when you amortize over all of the things that are generated. And ideally, you would like to do a constant number of steps in each step um, without, you know, without doing that kind of amortization. And so that structure, uh, you can maybe uh, see intuitively that you could probably use it to do some of this stuff. And I think, for me, right now, the most interesting thing is generalizations to other tiles. Um, so, so taking some other set of tiles and restricting the number of tiles that you can actually, uh, they can have meeting at one point. Does that give, does that local restriction give you some global structure which make, so, so you can make interesting combinatorial objects and, um, and do some of these things that we did. So here's an example. If you take lozenges, and uh, equilateral triangles, you can uh, you can prevent five of them from coming together, and you get a very similar restriction, um, that, like a similar structure where, for example, here is what's equivalent to a vortex, and these are rays which are propagated out from it. Here's what's equivalent to a V, a couple of rays coming from it. These are loners, and so on. Um, so then we wondered, we wondered maybe we can use some of our same set solver techniques for um, for showing that it's uh, showing that it's hard to decide whether or not you can cover a given region with just the the lozenge shaped ones. We don't know the answer. We didn't try. And um, another decision problem that you can look at is uh, it's kind of a tomography problem where. Uh, so let's let's say I give you um, 
say you have a covering like this one, and, uh, and I tell you that in the top row there are three monominoes and one domino. So it's these guys here. And then, um, and I do that for each row. And then in this column there's one monomino mm -hmm. and one domino. So that's these guys here. And I do that for, for, each, for each column. And, uh, and so you could play this as a game. You know, maybe I could, just, I could just give you this and tell you that there is a covering that satisfies uh, a covering with these row and column projections. And you could fill that in with a pencil or something. But maybe I could give you some row and column projections and ask you whether there is a tiling, uh, sorry, a covering which satisfies those. And so there's another, uh, that's the decision problem here. So is there a tatami covering of this grid with these row and column projections? And we don't know the answer to that either. And we have a, we have a couple more minutes. Um, okay, so if you're tired of all these discrete problems, uh, this did at least inspire a continuous one. It's called the water strider problem. And uh, again, I'll point out that we have these x's and that, and that the the, the legs of the x's can't intersect. And so we could define this as, uh, as a continuous problem where I no longer require that, uh, that, my, that the corners of the grid are, um, are on integer points. And there are two, two problems that we can have now. We can have a packing problem or a covering problem. And I think that the one that I've stated here is the covering problem. So is there a configuration of at most k water striders such that no two striders intersect and uh, no more water striders can be added? So the, the question is, can you, cover this, can you cover the given region with k water striders? Uh, and then the packing version of this, of course, is can you fit k water striders into this region? So, so the strategy for placing them would be different. And, um, and this I'm sure it doesn't, uh, besides being kind of generally the same shape and inspired by the other problem, doesn't have any direct relationship with it. But uh, it was kind of cute. And I made a little graphic for, uh, for Durham using my SAT solver. And, um, and thanks for having me.